Oh, really? That's what you think, Sarah? Hey, JVL, you I know what? I feel like I said no. that. You, no, JVL, you, you said? I'm glad you brought this up. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the next level. I'm JVL here with my best friends, Sarah Longwell and Tim Miller. You'll have to excuse me. I'm a little under the weather today because yesterday I went against my own best instincts and I went out into the world and saw people. And as happens every effing time I do this, I am now sick 24 hours later. Lesson? Everyone stay home and be a hermit. When Cassidy Hutchinson was like, I would like to not live as a hermit. I was like, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> Living like a hermit is the greatest thing in the world, girl. Have you, seems... have, have you considered that perhaps you not interacting with people ever has done something to make you like, like your, your immune system is like cratered as a result. No, and now. Like... Or so, have you yes, considered I've that this thought, is I've psychosomatic that. and that you've like, yeah, well, this is a brain luck. thing. You've convinced yourself that you're sick. That is a real possibility. That's a live possibility. But I think what happens is my immune system is constantly fighting a war against all the germs my children, my four children, bring into the house. And, like, it's already stretched to, to the, you know, to the thinnest little thing. And then you add one more random person's germs to it, and the whole system tips over. Have you thought about a fifth child? <sighs> no. Uh... <laughs> What is it about being sick that requires you to put that thing on your head? I'm cold. It's a it's just a beanie. What's what's wrong? It's it's a beanie. Can I not wear? But Tim was making fun of me for this too. Here, I'll take it off and I'll just sit here and be cold. (laughs) This this is becoming your hair looks awesome. This is becoming like a costume show. People really do need to to engage with this show on YouTube. If you uh, Sarah and I yesterday taped the Sunday show. And Sarah looks so ridiculous throughout the entire <laughs> show. She's dressed like Coach Prime. What is it? I was sitting with it, Sarah while what, she was primping. Was, was she, she dressed her like sunglasses? Coach Prime? Did she have aviators on when she was primping? Well, do you know why she had aviators she on? Because otherwise me. you all would have thought that she was high. Because she had just come from the eye doctor and her pupils were dilated. And I said to her when she sat down, you better put your sunglasses on because Tim he told is me I needed say, to do it. Oh, Sarah's high. But it is true that Henry Winkler got on the podcast and said hello to Tim, and he's like, "And who are you?" <laughs> <And> <laughs> it's wonderful. Who is this it's, crazy person? It's a great show. You're going to have to engage with it on YouTube. And Sebastian reminds us that this is our last Wednesday show on the TNL YouTube. So subscribe yes. to the Bulwark YouTube feed if you haven't already. I don't understand why we've been talking about it for a month. Good. Uh, all right, so. We have a weirdly packed show this this to today, and uh, I'm going to do my best to get through it before I, I collapse into a heap. Uh, tonight, a debate, per, well, that too. Perhaps the most important debate in the history of presidential debates, uh, a nation will be tuned in to Fox Business to see seven <laughs> presidential candidates really hash out the issues that voters want to see them discuss the issues that voters care about and uh i i am trying to be open to the possibility no this isn't part of it i'm trying to be open to the possibility that something could happen that might be meaningful here but i have a hard time seeing it the only thing that i i can the only thing that i can see that might be interesting is watching six or five of the seven Republicans defend Bob Menendez and insist that he should not resign, which is the position of both Tom Cotton and Marco Rubio, because that's amazing. Uh, but other than that, is is there any reason anybody should care about this thing? Yeah. Okay. Please uh, pitch it to us. Uh, I mean, I think this is DeSantis's last best chance like i do think we are watching uh this is look this is the undercard debate's always been about second place to some degree at some point second place will i think matter some because there'll be an attempt to do you know some one-on-one um like that's the, that's the dream for one of these second place candidates right, right? does it becomes a two-person race and in fact ronda sansis's team continues to insist that it is a, still a two-person race uh and so you know, Nikki Haley did and get. He's a- right. It is Vivek Ramaswamy versus <laughs> Donald Trump. That's the race. You know, I was looking. Uh, do you know how much money is in Ron DeSantis's Never Back Down? Like pack? ninety million. 
$97 million. And this is where uh, I, I sort of hadn't had my head around the figure. I knew it was high. Uh, but they have so much money still. There's no chance, no chance they're, they're getting out. Uh, and so I am interested in seeing how Ron DeSantis, how hard he goes tonight, because they must understand that it is if they can't get a bounce out of this, if they can't sort of crawl back and get some momentum, it's probably they'll keep spending the money because Jeff Rowe needs like a fifth house or something. But I don't know. Can I get before you yeah. go, Tim? Look, ninety seven million dollars sounds like a lot of money. But it all depends, right? If I said you had $97 million to buy a Lego set, you'd be like, yeah, no problem. If I said no, you had $97 million to buy a professional sports franchise, you'd say, well, shit, that's not enough money. If I said you had $97 million to convince people that Ron DeSantis was good, you would say, like with a sports franchise, well, shit, that's not enough money. Uh, but that's because there's not enough money in the world to convince people that Ron DeSantis is good. The question is, I think the question is, is, at what point do people start making the case to DeSantis that to preserve his political prospects, he gets out before he gets humiliated in oh. Iowa, right? Oh, really? That's what you think, Sarah? Hey, JVL. You I know feel what? like I said no. that. You, no, JVL, you, you said, I'm glad you brought this up. I'm glad you're trying to Go claim ahead. that you were correct, because what you said was he drops out in two weeks. And I said. TikTok. No way. It's the no, two I weeks said his we campaign was over in two weeks and there was no. a chance he drops out before Iowa. Uh, let's roll the let's go to the video yeah, tape. Button. I don't know we'll about that. No. I think there's a little revision. I'm with JBL. Sarah. I'm with Sarah on this. JBL, you 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 over you overshot. You're a little over the ski, over your skis on this prediction. But Sarah also not always right. It turns out because we we've done this. I'm having I'm having deja vu right now. We had a podcast. It was the day of the debate. Before the debate, JBL asked, "Does this matter?" And Sarah's like, "Yes." This matters for right. four candidates. And, and I, was I was right. Like, no, this matters at all. Not at all. I would no. I was correct. It mattered not at all. It did nothing. The debate did nothing. Nikki Haley went from five to eight, uh -huh. and Ron DeSantis went from fifteen to fourteen, and Donald Trump stayed at fifty. Uh, okay, so I think that well, we may have definitions, different definitions of what matters at all, because I think that the last debate, a whole bunch of things happened. First of all, it impacted all of the people that I said. Tim Scott, nobody's talking about him anymore, right? He's out. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy became the person that everybody was talking about and got at least a little, he certainly got a name ID bump and only a small polling bump. Nikki Haley, I think, has emerged as like the person who, if there's a sec, if Ronda, like the person that the establishment will coalesce around potentially is the second place choice, certainly a donor choice. Uh, and Ron DeSantis didn't do enough to blunt the downward momentum the downward death spiral of his campaign that all that I mean, mattered to some degree. i guess it's all chattering class stuff though if you just looked at the real clear politics average and and if you just looked at the chart it's like five dead people and and nikki haley has one little heartbeat boop boop uh, you know, like the lines are straight. <laughs> like nothing, nothing happened with voters. So I, I hear you. I guess it did matter a little bit in, in the donor class. It was funny. It, it did make one difference. A little birdie, little friend of the pod, um, so to speak, uh, suggested this morning that I tune in to the editor's podcast, National Review, their pre their pregame show for the debate. And I was intrigued that they are now weighing whether maybe Nikki Haley had the right strategy. And so I guess it, it did make a difference when Ron DeSantis' own fanzine starts to wonder, hmm, maybe, maybe you know, our... Wait, our what's not, show? What, what is the strategy of hers? What kind of God, they, what kind of God king better? would DeSantis be? If Trump is an orange God king, what would DeSantis be? Maybe our nasal voice God king. We'll work on that. Uh, send in some suggestions. Uh, maybe he should have distinguished himself from Trump was one of the ideas that they proposed on You're that. You're kidding. Um, I, know, I know. So, oh my God. And, you know, and maybe... Put them uh, on payroll. Uh, and, and maybe, maybe Nikki Haley now is... Now there was a little bit of disagreement. There was, there was some chatter. There was, you know, some... Uh, some coming to terms with the fact that maybe it didn't matter at all, um, you know, and, and maybe Donald Trump was unbeatable. But, I, you know, I, I guess in some ways, you know, it did... Uh, I think validate for people that Donald Trump is an overwhelming favorite and, th and that it's not really two man race at all. But like most of the voters already knew that, you know, most of the people voting in the Republican primary. And so, you know, it didn't really change a whole lot, which a whole lot with them. And I, I don't see why tonight 
would be any different. I mean, maybe Ron DeSantis, you know, ratchets up the Trump contrast, what, 10 percent, 15 percent? Like I saw him on Laura Ingram last night and, you know, he was... He was trying to put on his big boy boots and and offered a couple of a couple of stern criticisms of Donald Trump and uh, you know more so than he did in the last debate. So maybe you see that. But besides that, I, you know what on else what, is going to change? What is it? What what was his criticism? Was it on vaccines? Trump with his Operation Warp Speed was really <laughs> playing around with America's mRNA. Um, he was making he was making the argument that many of us suggested that he make you know ten months ago uh, about uh, Trump's efficacy. You know he made a comment about uh, the wall. Uh, he made a comment about I think the the endorsed candidates that lost. I, I forget. I, I wasn't you know I wasn't taking notes. This was uh, something that that scrolled through my my threads feed, but. Um, you know, I, 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 it was it was consistent. It wasn't like he did that. He was saying that he's like, oh, Donald Trump wasn't that effective, but he was really good. You know, he was he, he kept pivoting. This was like a three minute little rant about Donald Trump. So that's something uh, he's warming up. I guess that's a little different. But, I, you know, I, I don't see how any of that fundamentally changes the trajectory that we're on on Fox Business and Rumble. It'll be it'll be streaming on Rumble <laughs> as well. Uh, OK, uh. Good I Lord. do. I do think. So I agree with all that, and I, but I do. I guess there is the part of me that's like, if Trump were to, like, if the exogenous event that they're all banking on, right? Like they all have this sort of theory of the cheeseburger. Trump dies. I get to be the number two. Yeah. I am. I am marginally. Fingers. Yeah, I'm marginally invested in the idea of Nikki Haley being the number two versus Donald or uh, Ron DeSantis being the number two. Uh, Got it. So in the cheeseburger world, yeah. in the che- in the cheeseburger in paradise world, if you will, yeah. um, you're, what you're saying is just in case that happens, the one or two percent chance that we get the cheeseburger in paradise, you would like for Nikki Haley to be in second. You know, because maybe you know uh, that would be better for the republic. That's, yeah, although, that's, what, that's basically be, what you're saying. That's what that's what matters about this about this debate tonight. Positioning for just in case Trump dies. No, I mean, look, I think that it's just interesting. I like. I think sure. the idea that like it doesn't matter at all. Like, I don't know. I think watching how Ron DeSantis continues to flail through this is interesting to me. Uh, I watching like. People have to reckon with candidates on paper versus candidates uh, IRL and their performance uh, is interesting to me. Like Tim Scott, good on paper. Tim Scott clearly has no future in this party, uh, like on his own. Uh, and part of that just comes down to like lack of political talent. Ron DeSantis, I think, has very much been in heir apparent territory. So, you know, when Trump finally does die in uh, 2032 and is no longer uh, the president after his God. long reign. Um, you know, Ron, Ron DeSantis uh, has Sarah, been, that's too dark even for sorry, me. Sorry, sorry. Uh, and I think that, like, Ron DeSantis could be in territory soon of end of political... Like, he could go... I, like, this is where I sort of... Uh, where I do agree with JVL that, like, at some point when your expectations were too high and they drop so low that actually you get counted out now. You go to Scott Walker land. Yeah. You're just eating ham sandwiches. Well, also, the most interesting I mean, thing that could happen tonight is Tim Scott could bring his girlfriend from Canada. That would be brilliant. That, I mean, that would, that would do I the mean, thing. Wouldn't America, America love to meet her? <laughs> would. Wouldn't America love to meet her? I am kind of waiting for it to be like he pulls out his wallet and it's one of the, the photos that come preloaded into the... <laughs> you have to, in a picture frame? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You're like, you should right here. Right here. You know, I saw Eric Erickson tweet something the other day that was like, uh, this is the part, the Democrats are the party of uh, castration of boys. Uh, what was it? It was like castration, boys in girls sports, and like something else like insane. Uh, and... It is like watching uh, like a collective, what is it? Like a, not hysteria, but like a collective mass, delusion. Mass like onset an, psychosis. Like, that's right. Where like what they're going to do is they're all going to decide, right? I'm like, oh, like seeing Eric Erickson do that was like, okay, 
This is the lie that you tell yourself to justify Trump. Like Biden, I don't think you even have to go as far as JVL with like Biden's Brian been Kemp Reagan's third term. Yeah, right. The, the idea, he said they're the gonna... obscene positions. That's what, right. Which obscene positions? The ones about the, the infrastructure spending? The no, they're the going to they're going to it's going to be like almost like Q stuff. It's like this, like the castration of boys, like what they mean is saying that, like. Parents and doctors have a discussion about uh, like they're the ones choosing is Biden how to deal with trans boys? kids. I, I... But also, yeah, like I don't know, but Biden's I don't think Biden's position is that boys should be in girls sports. Uh, but like that is how they that's why so the president doesn't have any fucking say over that. Like, I'm sorry, the President of the United States cannot say to the New Jersey Scholastic Athletics Association, <laughs> you guys have to do this. Yeah. They don't get to do that. That's not how it works. You're, and and just, just like to talk about just how cowardly these people have been and how little they stepped up to the plate. I don't think Brian Kemp's endorsed anybody, by the way. Did he endorse DeSantis officially? Here we go. Let me pull this up. I've got the DeSantis endorsement list in front of me. Um, uh, if you take away, no, his only governor endorsement is Kevin Stitt, Oklahoma. Uh, if you take away Ooh. the people who just like did the safest possible thing and, and endorse their home state person, like the North Dakota House person endorsed Doug Burgum, you know, for example. So like if you want, if you eliminate that, the only members of Congress who have endorsed somebody that are, is not a blood relation or a member of their home state is Bob Good, Virginia. Uh, Tom Massey, who's a libertarian lunatic from Kentucky, Chip Roy from Texas, and Rich McCormick for Georgia. Those four have endorsed DeSantis. That's it. That's it. There are 200 plus people in the House of Re- in the House of Representatives. Didn't uh, like, Norman? Didn't Norman in South no, Carolina? Yeah, just, yeah, but he's from South Carolina. That's what I'm oh, saying. There's another Carolina, five yeah. that endorsed their home state, whatever. Right. You know, but uh, uh, DeSantis doesn't have a single senator. I, I, I don't believe that there is, I'm looking right now, I don't believe that there's a single sitting senator that is not, that has endorsed somebody that is not their home state candidate. Um, yeah, that's correct. Uh, oh, wait, no, that's not true. Tim Scott has a few. Tim Scott has a couple. He's at 1%. I, like, what are these people, like, I, everybody is, everyone, it is September 27th. Donald Trump attempted a coup, and this week he said he wanted to kill his own head of the Joint Chiefs. So he, he's threatening to kill rival military officials. Yeah, he but attempted you know. a coup. He, he wants to take down broadcast networks. The donors who said that they don't like Trump, they've already given up. They've already given up. Okay, and and the 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 leading members that are sitting in Congress, they're all they're all basically for Trump, and and the folks that have retired, with the handful of obvious exceptions, we don't need to name, like are doing nothing, and even some of the obvious exceptions, like Brian Kemp, have already acknowledged that they're going to be for Trump. Tim, and this is fucking look, lunacy. Let me help you out here. If the American people look at all yeah. this and vote for Trump, then we deserve this. Sure. I'm but sorry. Could people we try? Yes, could people the... try? That's all I'm saying. Just try. Like, don't, don't like tell me that you're one of the good ones and, oh, I'm supporting this ad. And I, and I got calls from people that work for these super PACs last time I bitched about this. They're like, we're going to, we're coming in, we're testing, we're testing. I don't like Trump either. I don't, like, don't, don't fucking whisper to me that you don't like Trump either unless you are actually trying to do something to stop him. Because this is crazy. Fair and like and and I, and I hear you JVL I hear you this might be like there might be nothing that can be done but but like the lack of effort is 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 just astonishing to me well, yeah. we, and, and and nobody not, we have Cassidy sorry, we've God, picked sir. up since the last time we've picked up Cassidy that's who we've mm-hmm. picked up she's out there thank you Cassidy yeah. she's 26 so Ki- Kim Reynolds uh who's the governor of Iowa so clearly prefers Ron DeSantis and hates Trump and Trump attacks her uh, publicly. And what does she do? She just doesn't endorse anybody. Mm. She decides to just not endorse. Even though she's yeah. an extraordinarily popular. And this was the thing. I think DeSantis was counting on her to endorse him. Uh, because they are pals. Governor pals. And I think she actually is like one of these kind of secret normies yeah. who hates Trump. But guess what? How much Nothing. How much did it matter last time around when uh, Nikki and Tim Scott jumped in to endorse Rubio right before South Carolina? Some. Yeah, I, that, right? that, I think that's true. I think it's true that people can tell themselves it didn't matter last time. But again, this is a collective action problem. And, and also, it's a cop-out 
to be like, well, what does my, I don't, everything real, like, I don't know about you guys. But didn't you grow up being told like a single grain of sand, one, like that we can make a difference, like be the change. Yeah. I just don't understand this idea of, well, what what difference would it, would it make if I say something? Well, George here's, W. Here's Bush, I, it will make a difference. You should all say something. It makes a difference to your soul. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's what yeah. it makes a difference to. Okay. Right? It and makes I a difference to, this, to doing JBL. the right thing. That's, I that's what it makes a difference I was to. on the field in 2016 trying to recruit people. A lot of people told us no. In Wisconsin, to Charlie's credit, to our colleague Charlie's credit, in Wisconsin, we tr- Cruz beat Trump. And it was a it was an effort of the local talk radio guys, D- uh, Walker, Ryan, like everybody, Reed Ribble, like everybody spoke together, and that mattered. That mattered in Wisconsin. Now, like, can we do that again? It's been eight years. It's a cult now. People have left. Maybe not. I don't know. But but are you telling me that if Kim Reynolds, I I, I can tell you what the Kim Reynolds team would tell you they're just waiting. You know, we'll see. Maybe we'll endorse in December. Mm-hmm. We want to see who has the best chance. Da, da, da. And maybe she'll do that. Maybe she'll. They're not going to be rushed into this on some arbitrary. But are you timeline. telling me it wouldn't make a difference? Difference if the governor, if, if Reynolds and Grassley, and you know uh, Joni Ernst, if, if the Club for Growth or whoever spent fifty million on every you know news out a news station in Iowa running ads that said Donald Trump is a danger, he's a loser, he's pathetic. I saw him firsthand. I'm going to be for Ron DeSantis. That wouldn't move things three percent, four percent. So okay, so maybe it's how, like we don't want to blow ourselves up to we'll move things three percent, four percent. That's no. fine. I guess that's fine. But don't tell me it doesn't. It wouldn't matter. It could matter. On the margin, it could matter in the trying. general election. For sure, these people aren't willing to risk helping a Democrat. Yeah. That's, I mean, that that's the real problem here, right? Where they have some leverage is, as you say, in that like one, two, three percent for the for the general election. Yeah, I just but none I, of these people are going to do that. I'm a little worried uh, that if people they're not coming out hard during a primary. Right. Like uh, this this thing from the National Review, like, well, we're arguing uh, that Trump should be. And it's like, I bet if I did the ratio of articles that you've written about Trump shouldn't be the nominee uh, relative to like Hunter how, Biden. Forget yeah, Hunter Joe Bi- Biden. That's right. Just that's Hunter right. Biden. Uh, yeah. Like nobody nobody is meeting the moment on the danger or being clear-eyed about it but anyway but the, but the point is is like the safest time for these republicans to come out and really go hard against trump is during the primary because there are other republicans yeah. they can support and so if a bunch of these guys aren't coming out now i'm skeptical that they will come out during a general election but this is i could I'm be wrong Beyonce tonight i could be so wrong move. but wait can i just argue against myself yeah, for one yeah, second yeah, please just i do also think though people don't understand like, they don't think it's over yet in the focus groups either. Um, but, like, they still think there's a chance for something to change. And I think as long as they tell themselves something could still change in this primary, uh, they don't feel like – I do wonder if once Trump is the actual nominee, some of these guys, I think, could come out and say something. Like, I, I just hold out this hope for, like, George W. Bush and those types – to come out and say something this time if it's yeah, Trump. Sure. He'll send a press release. Well, here's here's the thing that, that interests me. Uh, because it's not the case that Trump is doing a pretty good job of hiding all of the crazy, right? It's <laughs> not the case where Trump is trying to put up the mask of normalcy to give all these people alibis. Things keep getting worse for Trump. He does things like the Millie thing, like the saying he's going to do whatever he's going to do to NBC Universal for whatever reason. Uh, he, we had the summary judgment yesterday in the New York State Attorney General's case against the Trump Organization, finding, again, just summary judgment, massive fraud to the tune of uh, the Trump Organization is going to be disbanded and barred from doing business in New York State. Now, um, again, this is just another. It's not like these people can even hide behind like, well, that was all in the past. He's, you know, he's learned his lesson. Things are, he's on the up and up now. Things just keep getting worse and worse and worse. And because that's the trajectory we're on, I have a hard time seeing the pathway for these people to change and shift and say, okay, well, now I'll be against it. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
I mean, in one yeah. jurisdiction, there's a hilarious George Conway map on X. It's like there's like a seven block radi- radius where you can see where Donald Trump's business has been declared a fraud. You know, where uh, he was, uh, you know, he's un- under indictment for campaign finance violations, lying about his, you know, his affair with Stormy Daniels and where he was, you know, convicted by a jury of his peers civilly uh, held responsible for rape. Like that all happened within seven blocks in New York. And uh, like that has not yielded any movement. And then Trump's response to all this stuff is delusion uh, is insane. It's like hard to keep track of all the insanity, you know, like, I mean, his response to the to the business, like that he's been running a fraudulent business, which we all knew for decades um, that screwed over regular working class people. Um, uh, his response to that is that, oh, they undervalued Mar-a-Lago. Mar-a-Lago is worth one point eight billion. Oh, really? <laughs> really? $1.8 billion, I guess maybe because of all the state secrets that are in there. Uh, I guess if you lump that, if you lump that <laughs> together, like that's, that's, that's part of why. I mean, he, it was, uh, uh, there, there was another one that I came up this week. I was reading some article that was like a, uh, Alapanda did a nice thing, like where he's running down all the crazy stuff that he did. And, and like, you know, John Kelly was testifying to things in, in one of his lawsuits that I didn't even know, like about about crazy stuff that he was he was preventing. And there's just a constant onslaught of ins- of insanity. A- and yet, you know, uh, like Brian Kemp's judgment is that he's clear. It's clearly better. Right. So I, I, Not I, just I better, concur with that. a lot better. <laughs> That's my favorite. My favorite thing in the entire Kemp statement is the inclusion of a, a lot. lot. As if it's not even really a close call. Not a close call. Biden. Uh, uh, yeah, these guys' judgment can't clear the lowest of moral bars. Uh, yeah, they can't. It all is. Right. Uh, yeah. Today, during tonight during the debate, Trump is going to go meet with the union workers, I guess. I uh, I hope that Tim Scott attacks him for that and says that because uh, I, I assume you guys saw Tim Scott's thing on this which is that he really liked what Reagan did to the air traffic controllers and if he was president he'd like to do something similar to the the United Auto Workers it's just like this is why you're losing dude uh, so I don't know I would like to see the Republicans on stage attack Trump for being friendly to unions that would be that would be great um do you guys have a sense? Are you guys as dark as I am on the idea that the unions are going to wind up at the rank and file level, basically be with Trump and not Biden? Am I wrong? But they already were. That's like not a new. Uh, first of all, right. rank and file union members uh, have historically been uh, much more Republican than the leadership. Uh, yes. And I think that, you know, Trump's populist takeover of the Republican Party had a lot to do with the fact that he ran as somebody that sort of white working class uh, and I think increasingly a multiracial working class feel like they can identify with. Um, And so what's he will he will find a way to elide uh, actually siding with the union sort of economically, but he will fake side with workers in a way that he has done for a long time and in his faux populist way that these a lot of these folks are attracted to again this is a man who refused to pay many of workers to what they were contractually owed because his entire rationale as a businessman was to sign a contract and then after the work is done to renegotiate the contract because he had the money to withstand yeah. legal there's lawsuits a, there's a great old clip that was going around from like 2008 from the last UAW strike where Trump was asked about this because he does he did interviews constantly even you know before he was a politician and he was like you know it's like I I got I deal with this with guys at my work he's like I give him a three percent bonus one year and then fi- another five percent the next year another eight percent the next year then another three percent the next year next thing you know they're making more than me you know it's like okay yeah sure um, but uh, he's like and I think that the unions that's a problem that the union guys have like you know the the executives <laughs> that the head honchos end up getting paid. Less than the workers because they keep getting raises every year. So this is your this is your man of the people, um, working man saying, I don't, you know, I don't. I, this is a. I, I think Joe Biden deserves credit for going out there. I, I, I fundamentally, you know, and and not probably in the communist JVL and Joe Biden 
uh, viewpoint on you know on various union related policies. I have certain sympathies uh, to union workers, but you know I think that sometimes the union leadership is is goes a little bit overboard on some of the stuff. Um, but like I, it is strategically speaking, putting that aside, obviously I desperately needed, and and I'm happy that Biden went there the day before Trump and d- didn't get outflanked on this. And because if you just look at the numbers, there are polls out this week. Like, it is a problem for Democrats, right? Like, uh, if you just look at it over a time horizon, like, despite the fact that Democratic policies on economic issues haven't really changed, if anything, they've kind of become more pro-worker, really. Like, if you look at the Clinton era to now, the view of Democrats among working class white folks in particular, but not just white folks, working class voters, is that they don't care about people like them to the same degree. And so you have to do the performative nonsense to demonstrate to them that you do care in addition to the policies. The policies matter, but so does the signaling, the social signaling. And uh, and so I, I think it's good that Biden went there um, and, and I was concerned about that. I thought it was smart of Trump to, to counter program with, with these guys. And I think Biden did take the air out of that bubble a little bit. But can I just say that like this, the auto worker, like, Part of the, so I I agree with Tim. My my sympathies are also not quite uh, with the UAW, it, especially the basically sort of the anti progress thing here. Like it, it, you are pitting Democrats who want more electric cars for environmental reasons against union workers who want to keep combustible engines because they want to keep making the cars with a lot of parts in the way that they always have, and they want to make more money and they want to continue to have the same deal. But like the industry's changing, and like. The part of why they're going to be mad at Biden is because uh, Biden is pushing sort of this revolution it, or pushing us as a country more toward electric vehicles uh, because they're better for the environment. And so, like, this is that's a that's a central tension that Democrats sort of have to deal with. Yeah, but so here's I, I wonder, is that so that is the logical tension and that would make sense. Right. I mean, I could see that. But if that were the case, and this was all following logic, then the the people, the non-union blue-collar workers who would be getting all of these new non-union jobs in Tennessee and Kentucky and Georgia and South Carolina would be pro-Biden because Biden was making those jobs that they were getting possible. And my sense is that that's not happening. Like, this is a lose-lose. Those people are all going to still... Ah, oh, Joe Biden's terrible with all that environmental stuff. But boy, I just got a new job. That's great. Our town is coming back because we are, we're building a factory right over there. Yeah. yeah. There's a ton of like factories that are being built right here in Louisiana between New Orleans and, and Baton Rouge. Like a ton of stuff that's related to government incentives, you know, from these various bills, whether that's, you know, kind of carbon capture stuff or, or you know, other other sorts of, sorts of more clean energy. And I don't I, I guess I just don't expect to see, you know, the whatever it is, Jefferson Parish, whatever the parish, I, I'm going to yeah. learn my new state better. What, I, I don't expect to see the ex-urban New Orleans parishes between here and Baton Rouge where, where the uh, where these uh, factories are going, you know, to start changing from red to blue anytime soon. Yeah, but can I just say like this t- to me, and I, I could be talked out of this, but this is me thinking it through. I feel like these are where Joe Biden struggles on sort of the communication side of talking directly to people about the fact that like so they've got they're doing all of this revitalizing manufacturing actually comes with they like they're doing a lot of it it's in these infrastructure bills but a lot of it is new green energy manufacturing stuff right it's like parts for solar parts for uh wind and like i think you've got to talk to people about that because what the uaw is trying to do is hold on to a world that's leaving and frankly to a world that joe biden is helping to push into reality, right? They they have a they really want this new world. And so I think that like you've got to get up and sort of level with people and be like here's what we're doing to try to bring manufacturing back. Here's how it's going to work, but it might not look the same as it always has. And like nobody's really talking to people and it, this is where it's sort of a la- in like creating I think what is a real narrative around how manufacturing is changing in the country, uh but how Democrats are are ushering a new era that's going to provide good paying jobs. It's going to revitalize unions, but like people are going to have to 
have a like look to the future about this. And instead, it's going to give Trump because they're not talking to people. You just get this opportunity for Trump to like slide in there and just tell lies about China and to sort of ride on what is going to be a working class, somewhat populist backlash to electric vehicles. Because, you know, who doesn't drive electric vehicles yet? Like regular voters, like the people who are going to make electric vehicles sure as heck can't currently afford electric vehicles. Yeah, I mean, except that the Biden administration is, I mean, you know, part of the package here is they have a whole slew of incentives for the union states to retrofit existing factories, right? And the, the and this is, as you say, the, the tension here is they create incentives for the auto manufacturers to switch over to EVs, which the auto manufacturers take as a chance to move production out of union states into right-to-work states. They had to try to counteract that what what the administration is trying to do is incentivize them to stay stay where they are and retrofit existing factories, which I think is like the responsible policy re- reaction to that problem they've created, right? I mean, it is a that's kind of what what we would want, right? We uh, manufacturing is changing; it will cause some economic dislocation. So they are trying to use the resources of the government to minimize that dislocation. They just don't get any credit for it with voters. And again, I, I don't know, I, like, it's hard to get credit with voters if you're not there. I mean, I just, I did, I did a focus group with Democrats was it yesterday. I mean, they don't know anything. I mean, you should, you should hear how unhappy the Democrats are with Biden. And I'm sorry, but like, they have no idea what was in. They're like, he hasn't done anything. Like that is a, they feel like he hasn't done anything. They feel like he doesn't fight hard enough. And this is where I think having somebody who was capable of really explaining this moment to people who was able to, you know, forcefully advocate. uh, And instead, like, I know they're spending millions of dollars on ads to be like, kind of happy, new, this is stuff that we did. No one knows, though. I, I don't know. I like I don't know anything about their strategy or like how much they're putting into it. But that story, voters don't know it. That's great. All right, Sarah, uh, you get to choose. Last topic. Do we do Deion Sanders or Cassidy Hutchinson? Can we do both? Sir, are they unrelated to one another? Sure. Sure. Long show. I, I am surprised. Good for you. I'm not All rush. Right. Uh, so, wh- where do you want to start? Tim, so you choose, You pick first then. Cassidy well, I wrote Dion. about Dion. What did you think, JBL? Did you read my triad? Do you read other people's triads? I did. What did you think, did. About, my, uh, you think about my Dion take? Thought it was there were some mixed reactions and... in the comments. Really? Yeah. I, well, because Dion's uh, not I, a perfect so human. So against my better judgment, I am pro Dion, and uh, and I don't I don't like that sort of brashness. I really like how he's been in defeat, and as you said, I mean the the best thing about him was the uh, the reaction to that late hit by Blackburn in the the Colorado State game. That's the stuff that makes me like just jump all the way on board, right? Because that's, that's great coaching, great leadership. I love that thing. Taking the receiver aside after he's had a couple tough plays and telling him, hey, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You're my dog. I got you. That, that's the stuff that I just eat up and I love it. So I'm really, I, I'm, I'm rooting for him. And the other thing is, it's not like all of these other coaches in college football are great. They're scumbags. College football coaches are terrible it is a awful class of human, with this, with some exceptions, but college football coaches are a terrible class of human, for the most part. Why? And uh, you know, so it's not like like Dion is like ruining some wonderful fraternity of of men who are shaping young men or something like that. Well, Tommy Toberville was a former college football coach, Sarah. So that gives you a little insight into the kind of quality that you're getting. Yeah, not most wild of the time. about him. Um. Yeah, my thing about Dion is I also I, I didn't really come in with any pre pre existing positives or negatives. I mean, he was cool when I was a kid, but I was not like a Dion fan. He's on the Cowboys, and you know, so like in Florida State, and I didn't yeah. like either of those teams. So I, my the thing about Dion is every interview I watch, I'm just unbelievably impressed, like by the depth of his answers, the thoughtfulness. 
Steven Alexander. Now he brags, right? Like there's 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 the low calorie bragging and all that sort of cockiness too. But but like whenever you get into a challenging issue, like he is talking about the souls of the kids. One of the things I didn't mention in the article that I just really loved was um, after their first big win, when no like this team was one and eleven last year, Sarah. Like they had nobody. They were terrible. And he comes in. They win their first three games. And 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 after the first win, some uh, you know he was saying in an interview that like the kids were all excited. They're in a go party, and he was like, I want them to enjoy themselves. But what my message to them was, whatever you do, think about somebody in your life you respect, and think to yourself, would that person do this? And if they said yes, then all right, go ahead and go ahead and enjoy yourselves. Like I like that was like that. I just think that is just one small example of like a very human thoughtful advice that's not like some old white coach wagging their finger and being like we got curfew and you got to be in at 10 no it's like be a man think about somebody that's grown that you respect and like what how do they behave and and this is where it just does tie to the political thing for me like there is in a good world which we do not live in the conservative world would love Dion. like he is a family person he like he loves his kids he, he loves God. He's religious. He talks about Jesus. He talks about God. He talks about uh, being being a grown man, being re- being respectful, you know. And he also ca- likes money and capitalism, right? I mean, like, he is like a 1980s, you know, like perfect Republican. But he's black, you know, and he's, and he's a little bit brash. And he, you know... Uh, uh, He's also racially aware. That's He's very racially aware. He doesn't aware. do the Tim Scott thing. Right. I mean, you know, the race stuff is a real thing to Dion. And, you know, he has, he has exactly. talked about, yeah, you know, people don't like it when there's like, you know, a black man who's out there being cocky. Yeah. Like he, he, he gets it and is willing to say that and, out loud. And Republicans do not like that. And so because that is now, right, like the woke stuff, quote unquote, is now the fissure, Right. Not every, not every single person, right? Uh, but like you see this MAGA world that like goes against him, and like you see this on my feed, like everything has to be political now, right? And and it's just like man, if, if you just replace Trump with Dion, right? Like you would have the braggadocia, you'd have this confidence, but you'd have all these other virtues, virtuous qualities. He's not a perfect person. Yeah, that's what people in the comments are saying. Well, he did this and he did that. Yeah, he's not a perfect person, but he had, there's something to be said for espousing virtue. For virtue signaling instead of vice signaling, and and like this is is what I like has got gotten me a soft spot for him, and that is just so in contrast to all the fucking Trump nonsense, which is the exact opposite. And Sarah, I can't tell if you disagree or you're just supremely disinterested. I uh, caught like a little bit of him on sixty minutes, uh, and I was just like. This guy's talking about himself a lot. Like, what's all this hype about? Because I was like, and so I was, uh, and I have there is no, that, no doubt. Yeah, and I, I, I remember him. That I remember that he existed in popular culture when I was a kid. But like, I don't know anything about. Him, so I'm not following it that closely. The only thing I wanted to say is like, I want to give snaps to the idea that you know, virtue signaling gets a bad rap. <laughs> people act. People say virtue signaling is like a bad thing. Virtue signaling is great. Like, if Donald Trump, after all of the things that he did that were super bad in his life, and, like, they were all baked in, right? Like, we all knew, like, what a scumbag he was. But he became, as, like, a person both running for president uh, and also as president, somebody who talked about the mistakes he made, but, like, here's how, like, but I think you should be a good person or, you know, I'm going to virtue signal a lot. That would be a totally different ball game. I am not trying to hold bad things against everybody forever. In fact, I think that's something we do as a culture sort of wrong is like we don't let people grow. Um, and I think I think there's certain things that I find unforgivable, like if you, you know, sexually assaulted somebody or like killed like there's but there are Supporting Donald Trump coup. for a third presidential term would maybe yeah, be one yeah. for me. That's right. Um but anyway, I'm just like virtue signaling is a good thing and we could use a lot more of it because that Trump is vice signaling. That is what he does. Here's here's what you will really like about Dion, Sarah. Mm. When he came to Colorado with a program that was 1-11 and the year before, he told all of the existing players to leave and he said, I'm just going to bring my own players with me. You guys are losers. 
I'm bringing in a bunch of winners and we're going to win. I bet you like that sort of thing. Is that what he did? It is. Yeah. So he just brought in a bunch of new players? There's yeah. some old players, but a lot of new players. A lot of people got shown. I don't know if there's anybody from that team left. Yeah, there are, is there anybody some. left over? Yeah, there's some. But yeah. Not many. Um, oh, so he it's not, like he, took, he it's not like he took an existing Bad News Bears team and like turned them into winners. <laughs> no. He just no. like brought a bunch of winners in? Well, no. And I he mean, told... he brought a bunch of people from Jackson State and HBCU. Okay, right. like so he, brought, he, was, yeah. he was, yes, he was coaching at a historically black college. And he brought a bunch of players from that team who he believed were undervalued and underappreciated because they were at a historically black college. Yeah. And he brought them with him to a big, you know, Power Five conference. And this proved like, yeah, these these guys are good enough to be Power Five players, and we're going to win. Okay. Again, not perfect. Not saying he's Jesus. I, Don't think that we should have a cult to him. But I what's like. Wrong with that? I like it. What's what's wrong with that? These kids, well, you know, look, the kids nice at Colorado the did not around. lose their scholarships. None of those kids lost their scholarships. They could still go to college yeah, for right. free, and if they wanted to transfer and play football, somebody else somewhere else, they could. Yeah, it's not like these kids were going to the NFL anyway, right? Right. I, no, I, I just do think it's categorically different. I didn't realize that, um, just in what I've caught of the ephemera, that instead I, I thought that the Cinderella story of him was that, you know, he walks into a flailing program no. and through his uh, what excellence as a coach, he's turned that program around. But he actually no. just brought all the... No, it's through his yeah. sheer charisma and excellence that he brought in really good players. Yeah. <laughs> and okay. they're like, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go play for crime. Anyway, okay. speaking, of, speaking of people, other, other flawed heroes, Cassidy mm. also. I hate, you know what I hate about the, when I send something nice about Cassidy? There's always one liberal that's like, but she was there till the last day. It's like, I know, I know, okay? I know, I know, all right? But like, I, she still was 25, and she's still there when a coup is happening, and and, and grown ass men like Mark Meadows and Jim Jordan and are, and Donald Trump are all around her who are supposed to care about the country and they're like rooting for the coup and she's in there going wait whoa whoa this is bad can't we stop this that's not nothing that's not nothing and and the stories that she told in this book about what was happening as the as the building is being stormed I, did you see the one about the hanging where she was like i don't she was like she overheard trump and and jordan and meadows and some other people talking about hanging and she was like what are they talking about and then she realized they were talking about the hang mike pence chant and and, and it was after trump heard about the hang mike pence chant that he sent the tweet that's like mike pence is a coward i like that is astonishing so anyway, I don't know. Um, I, I think that uh, I, I hate that she is now getting from the right that's like, oh, I'm the shit that if you are in right wing Twitter that I have to suffer through, the grossness that she has to deal with is just unbelievable. It's un I mean, it's believable, but it is just so out of bounds about her looks and her, and her motivations and, you know, her soul. I, I guess it's just it's disgusting. And it's like she did it. She's taking it on. And she and there are people like oh she's got a book deal it's like no the the fast track was sticking the fast track was sticking financially okay she she's doing the she is doing a, exact uh, the best we can hope and the fact that it's only her is insane to me twenty six year old girl twenty six year old woman plenty of people in there just just Cassidy just Cassidy Sarah and Matthews. also like. Thank God for the twenty-something women through the Trump years because they are the only ones they they were and not just her like Olivia Shea Troy, Moss, Elizabeth, Shea Moss but, yeah. but like the people who testified in front of the January sixth committee, the people who have taken on death threats, and like you know I got to say, uh, Tim, I also see a lot of this right wing stuff, and it's even you know speaking of things that I don't follow, uh, I don't know who this football player is that is or is not dating Taylor Swift, who I also pay very little attention to. The number of conservative men in this bar, the, the both the barstool sports, as well as like these old conservative types who are out there talking about like Cassidy Hutchinson's looks or calling them. What did Navarro say? Like they're pimping like they're pimps. Yeah. Uh, JB uh, also told Roger Kimball called Taylor Swift homely yesterday. Roger yeah, Kimball Roger looks Kimble like Humpty Dumpty. He looks like a thumb with eyeballs. And like the, the these guys, the where. Hold 
he called Taylor Swift homely. homely. <laughs> He's one of I the mean, ugliest there people are I've ever a lot seen. of things you could say about Taylor Swift if you don't like her. The 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 woman is not homely. <laughs> That's crazy. Homely is the nicest also, thing you could say about Roger Kimball. Yeah, the okay. the mis- the misogyny, uh, like how brazen it is, how toxic it is, and like you see, didn't you guys watch? Did we ever talk about this? That guy Crowder, I, I, who's like the yeah. right wing talker, yeah, Stephen Crowder, and they they there was this video that came out of how he was talking to his wife, yeah. uh, like that was caught on a ring cam and. The way how like abusive he was and like disgusting to her, the things he was saying, and like you see this all over. Like there's this weird, uh, like infusion of that negging culture, right? Where like you, like there was like uh, what was that? There was like a book about about dating. Yeah, Tucker uh, Max. Yeah, Tula. but it was about how you Tula, how you right? make women yeah. feel insecure and terrible and treat them badly so they'll like you. Was yeah. like the that like infusion of that sort of the bar stool sports the um toxic and i didn't used to be someone who would be like toxic male culture but like that i don't know what else to call what i'm seeing right now about uh the way that people think it's fine um to talk about women so like i don't the 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 what what cassidy hutchinson has to deal with for people who want to like say well this isn't that brave like the amount just the mountain of disgusting shit uh and how and and the way that the right has now sort of co-opted um this toxic male stuff where like it is fine to just be disgusting to women and comment on their looks like that is now replete through the right yeah a common take i've seen is is uh, like multiple times different people trump when he gets back in shouldn't hire any young women yeah like like that's just like accept an accepted take in like the middle of the bell curve Republican uh, like Twitter world. Do right? they because not they tell understand the truth. how he hires? I, I don't. Do, I they, guess do they these do people not. not understand how Donald Trump makes hiring decisions? Yeah, I guess not. <laughs> All right, uh, good show, long show, last show on this YouTube feed. So you've been warned. Go sign up for the main YouTube feed, uh, and if you watch it on the podcast feed. D- don't worry everything's fine uh tim enjoy queen queen b queen bay what do she's they say so what, what's the pr- pronunciation so of that? good tonight big frida is going to be out there with her um it's going to be long i'm going to be tired tomorrow i've got to tape a lot of things tomorrow so i'm just I'm, it's like going to be a willis reed moment for me tomorrow just hung over after three and a half hours of beyonce she goes late into the night apparently but I'm going to do it. I'm going to get home. I'm going to watch this stupid, meaningless fucking debate. And then I'm going to have takes about it tomorrow. With and I'm going to sound like you with just a voice like this. I uh, that's that's amazing to me. We live such different lives. Uh, Sarah, Tim, see you guys on uh, Sunday. Bye. Peace. We got a good one Sunday. <laughs>